Hey everyone, welcome to the first episode in 2021 um, of the Happy Even After podcast. This is the first guest episode. So I am here with Brittany Zabo today. And if you're on TikTok, you probably know Brittany because she is like a kind of TikTok superstar over in that world. Um, but that's really not the reason why I had her here today. So Brittany's story and journey is so inspiring. Um, and it's really like, uh, if whoever watched Game of Thrones, I kind of picture like Khaleesi rising from the fire type of story. Like that's what I picture when, when I look at Brittany and everything that she's doing and sharing. Um, so she has recently started a business that is, the mission is to empower moms and other women and um, and she's using her past uh, to help elevate and, and empower people. So I'm super excited for this conversation. So welcome, Brittany. Hi, Renee. Thanks for having me. No problem. Mm -hmm. So let's just start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you say I do, and yeah. we all think it's going to be this, you know, happily ever after. Mm -hmm. um, and then something changes. So like, where did things, how did things start? Or where, where did they change for you? So, yeah, I feel like, honestly, things started from when we first met, but I just chose to ignore um, certain behaviors. So really, though, it was so we were married for uh, probably seven years in, um, and that's when things kind of, I honestly, I wasn't even really woke up to it. Other people were, and they were bringing it to my attention and saying these things weren't normal. And I was like, what? I've been with him for 10 years. Like, this is and they're like, no, 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 it's not. Um, just mainly like controlling behaviors and um, yeah, that sort of stuff. So that was about two years ago now um and we i kind of had brought the behaviors to his intention and like asked you know if he could work on them and it just it, ultimately it wasn't getting better so then that's when i had first brought it up to him about i'm possibly thinking about divorce but we wanted to make sure that we did everything in our power um to avoid that like divorce was the last thing Mm. we wanted to do obviously for our family um, so we did marriage counseling for um a while we actually had like five different therapists because oh, wow it, it just I don't know we were we, we were really not on the same page about anything mm -hmm. I think we both are very stubborn right now where I'm at I'm really good at taking ownership for my actions but I think back then he was, a, he was putting it all on me. This is all my fault. And I was putting it all on him. Mm -hmm. And we just, it ultimately, it wasn't, um, it just, it wasn't working. And um, so I had been very open and honest with him through the whole thing. Like I'm thinking about divorce. I just want to let you know, I had like took the kids and went back to Wisconsin for a month so we could have some time apart. And um, I tried to communicate with him as best I can. And his whole thing was he didn't want a divorce. Um, and so it was a big decision for me, to, you know, to know that this was going to be my decision. And then I actually, um, uh, really my, a big part of my story too is, um, I'm in recovery. So I'm an alcoholic and really the whole divorce did not start to have anything to do with my, with my drinking. Um, our, the drinking we did together definitely did not help our marriage at all. But ultimately, it didn't even start for any reasons regarding my um, my drinking. And in two thousand, okay, the summer of two thousand nineteen, um, after I took the kids for a month and we had some time apart, I came back and um, I ended up in the hospital. And I found out when I got out of the hospital that through a bill that we got in the mail that he had went behind my back and filed for divorce, which mm -hmm. he can do. But it's just like. I was very open and honest and communicating with him. And so just to find out the fact that he would actually go and do that and pay thousands of dollars and just really make a decision like that, I was shocked. And how old um, were your kids at the time? So my kids uh, were five and three. My daughter was five, uh, was five and then my twin boys were three. So, so yeah. So where do you go from there? Because like that's, I mean, talk about kind of like kicking you when you're down type of situation. Uh -huh. What happens when you come out? Yeah. So literally I, 
um, I come out and then he decides to say, well, I can still cancel it because it hasn't actually been filed. It had been like two days. And I was like, oh, no, no, buddy, you just did what I've been talking to you about for the last six months. So no, no, no. And he and then he and so he kind of was using it as a, as a threat. And then he did actually cancel it. So he didn't actually technically file. He just paid thousands of dollars to have all the work done and then changed his mind. Um, and, you know, to his defense, I don't know if he was in his best frame of mind during that time either. Um, but and then ultimately I was like, no, no, no. Like if we're, we're doing this now, like this, this has been, this decision has been made. So, but the best option and the only option we have, because we don't have a ton of money, the only option we have is going to a mediator and doing this together amicably. Like that's the only way this is going down. And so that's what we did. We went and had everything um, pretty much finalized. Um, but he still didn't want this divorce, even, even though he had already went and filed for divorce. And, uh, basically it says he was forced into signing these papers, which me and the other, you know, the, the mediator in there, we didn't force him to sign anything. It was, it was a decision that was supposed to be made for us. That was going to be best for the kids, you know, ultimately, because mm -hmm. we don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, to spend on a divorce, which. Actually, that's what ends up happening and happening. But um, yeah, so we did that. But then um, it kind of got, when it got down to like money costs, he, he basically didn't want to pay me a penny. And the mediator was like, well, like she, that's not going to work out. Here's what the court would, would say that you need to pay her. And he said he didn't want to pay me a single penny. And then that's when he went behind my back again. Um, I, what do they call that? Like auto litigation or something? I don't know. So he went and got his own attorney again, which I didn't know about. Um, and through this time too, now I had moved out. I had um, got my own place. I had to start all over because I, I didn't take anything from the house. So that was a huge expense. Um, but my drinking when I moved out went skyrocket. Mm -hmm. I think I like had this mindset in my head, like I'm free. I've been, you know, with this controlling person for so long, like now I'm free and I get to do whatever I want. And it just didn't go out well for Brittany. I only had maybe a month or two, um, moved out. So this is, um, August, 2019. I only had a month or two. And then ultimately, you know, I noticed that my drinking was a problem. And so I temporarily gave up custody of my kids to him for 30 days. So I could, how, how, uh, how yeah. difficult of a decision was that to make? I mean, I imagine that had to be like just gut wrenching. It was, it was, it was, it was gut wrenching. And that's another reason why we were going to go through a mediator because I have my issues um, with alcohol and he has his issues with other things. And we had both decided that we are not going to bring this up with attorneys. We are going to figure this out. So we, cause it, and so when we ended up having to bring it up to the mediator, um, so we were still actually going to the mediator during this stage. She was like shocked. She was like, Whoa, you guys didn't tell me like you had all this other stuff going on. We're like, well, we said we were going to keep it between each other, but it's clearly, you know, it's out there now. And so that was really hard. But in my mind, I was like, no problem. 30 days, I can do this. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize how far down I was in my disease at that time, because I think I got maybe a week and then I just couldn't do it. I could not stop drinking. Mm -hmm. And I pretended to the world like I was, and and there was no proof for anything that I was drinking, but I was drinking. And so the day that I was supposed to get them back after the 30 days, it was, well, November 12th, I get a phone call um, from someone, someone working at his new attorney's office, which I didn't even know. So I didn't even know he had had this new attorney yet. They called and said, hey, he has a court date tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. And I was so confused. I, I'd never been to court before in my life. And the court date tomorrow at eight in the morning, um, 
And I was like, okay, well, do I have to show up? And she said, no, you don't have to be there. So I was not served papers. I was not, um, nothing. And so I end up calling an attorney and going to meeting with her, going to meet with her. And she's like, honestly, like if you haven't been drinking, if you've done everything you've said, um, and you haven't been served papers, like if you are being honest with me, you have nothing to worry about. You don't need me there tomorrow. I will come with you there tomorrow, but it's going to cost you thousands of dollars. What do you want to do? And I was like, do you really think I'll be fine? And she's like, yeah. So what happened? So first of all, I wake up late. I'm going to cry because it's just like (laughs) Brittany, 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 you know? So I wake up late because I was literally up the night before drinking, standing in the mirror, like mocking what I was like, practicing what I was going to say to the judge because I was so nervous. So I wake up late. I get there. Um, but I don't know what I'm doing. I've never been in the courtroom before. I have no attorney with me. He has his, his attorney, his whole family there. And I'm, um, and I wasn't served papers. So I had no idea what I was walking into. And basically, um, the, the judge talks for a little bit and then she says, okay, what was ordered? And I said, okay, your honor, like, I just want to make sure like we're going back to our original schedule. Me thinking what that original schedule was, was before the 30 Mm -hmm. days I had gave up temporary custody, um, which was 50, 50. And she said, yes, what was ordered? So I walked out of that courtroom, called my mom. I thought everything was fine, but that's not what happened, right? No. Then I looked down at the paper and it says supervised and unsupervised visits. Oh my God. And like, I, that's and that is that was the worst thing so how long did that happen how long did that go on for that the supervised visits so um well one more thing for that day because that so that day okay so um you think like the worst the craziest thing in your life um that would happen would be you losing custody of your kids. And the craziest thing is that I still chose, I lost, ki- lost custody of my kids to my alcoholism. And, um, the first thing I did when I walked out of that courtroom was I went and got a drink mm-hmm. and like, it's terrible. Um, that that's how bad I was in the disease, you know, Thankfully, the next day I did end up checking myself into a detox because I had to be, that's the whole thing is when I, I, I needed a lot of help because I was, I was so sick that I, if I stopped drinking on my own, I would have seizures and all that. So I ended up checking myself in the detox. Um, and then when I got out, I had spent, I had, um, emptied my bank account to go in there. I paid out of pocket. So when I got out, I couldn't now afford this condo that I had just spent thousands, thousands of dollars getting everything for, you know, I finally, I finally got out of this situation. I was doing good, but now I can't go back there because I can't afford it. So I moved back in with him and the kids. And ultimately I wanted to be with my kids, you know, no matter what. So, and the whole thing is like, he took my kids away from me saying I was unfit to parent. Like I have, I had a problem with drinking, but, um, I wasn't like, I was like, I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to, don't want to like make, you know, make my drinking sound like it's okay. But he took them away from me for being unfit to parent and then just lets me move right back in. And it's like, Mm -hmm. if I, if you really thought I was unfit to parent, you wouldn't let me move back in. How long were you, did you move back in with him? How long were you there? I was at the detox for two weeks and then I moved back in. So I spent last Thanksgiving and Christmas back there with them. And then when did you move out again? So, um, I moved out, uh, well, I woke up one day, it was just bad. It was constantly like, um, us fighting and him trying to kick me out. So on February 1st of this year, I woke up to a suitcase being tossed on me, um, saying, get the F out. And I'm like, where am I supposed to go? Where am I supposed to go? So, and it got pretty bad. So I called the police, they came and they're like, yeah, she lives here too. You can't like just kick her out, but one of you need to leave. So I decided to be the good one to leave. Anyways, we ended up, we ended up getting into a fight and I actually get arrested. Um, and when they thought 
So they arrested me for being under the influence, which was crazy because I was actually sober. The only thing I was on, I was pres prescribed Valium for my alcohol withdrawals because I had relapsed in January. I was, I was a mess. It took me a while to get my, get my life together for sure. Um, so I got arrested. I had to spend, spend 12 hours in the drunk tank sober, which is funny because I am an alcoholic. I have been to the drunk tank many times, but never sober. Um, and when I got out, I, I, uh, I couldn't, oh, when I got out, I found out he had a restraining order on me and I could not, I wasn't allowed back in the house or around the kids. And so that's when I was basically homeless. Mm -hmm. Um, so this was the beginning of February. Thankfully that only lasted for a short time, um, because it was really, really bad. My thing was always alcohol, but I, 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 I was so depressed at this point. I couldn't mm -hmm. see or talk to my kids, you know, and um, the restraining order was on me for something that someone else said. And I told my ex-husband out of like concern for him, but he took it. He, he basically said it was a, a threat to him and I get it. I don't, you know, I don't know what I would have done if I was in his shoes yeah. because I, my, I was very, my very manic, my brain, um, like newly sober and then back. It, it was a mess. So when, when did things shift for you? Because they have yeah. shifted in a huge mm -hmm. way. And so yeah. that story that you tell is so, it's hard. Like I can feel the emotion. Uh, like I'm, I can feel like the hurt and the pain and everything that you went through, but you are not there anymore. Like yeah. you are out, you are in an incredible place. So when did that mm -hmm. change? Yeah. So February 9th, I chose to get sober. I got on a plane um, and went back to Wisconsin and got sober. And through that time, I actually decided I was really going to set my mind to changing my life. And the first thing was that I had to hire an attorney. Um, so I found a really good attorney. Most of them said it could be three to five years before you saw your kids, mm -hmm. kids again. And oh my gosh, like that for a mother to hear, it's just like, it was so hard. Um, but I stuck through it showed up at my court date and I actually got legal custody back, um, on February 28th. So I got legal custody back very quickly. Um, but that's, I was doing everything I was supposed to be doing. I was literally proving my, I bought like a smartphone breathalyzer and I was um, doing drug tests, going to meetings. I was doing everything I had to do, um, because I was serious about this and, you know, I've stayed sober ever since. And my mom actually ended up moving out here with me. So we were able to get a place together. Um, and so really I've had my kids, even though I haven't had custody the whole time, I've had them in my life the whole entire time, besides when the restraining order was on me for 28 days. Um, and yeah, so since this, and I pretty much in, I, and I still, okay, so once I got sober, I was like, are we going to... Um, I want to make sure that the divorce is still something I wanted to do um, with enough being enough sobriety time. And ultimately I decided that, yes, you know, we kind of had tried to reconcile and it just wasn't there. So in June, we, like I said, I was done. And because of the situation, we had to go like no contact. Um, and that was really, really hard. That was the hardest mm -hmm. decision because I didn't want to lose him as a friend, you know, um, like I love him, but I wasn't in love with him. And that was the hardest thing I've ever had to do that day. And, um, and you still have to co-parent too. Like yes. that's an added challenge. So that's the thing is that did not, that did not happen for us for the last six months. So for the last six months, you know, through that time, I started telling my short story on TikTok, and I had no idea. Like I literally started telling my story, um, to hold me accountable for, for my alcohol. So like the whole world knew that I was an alcoholic, so I can't really drink around anyone, you know? I really did to hold me accountable and what it has turned into is something so much more, so much more. It's, I had no idea how many people would be able to relate or have gone through something similar and need help going through something similar. And, you know, through this, I have, you know, met now, like my, all of my best friends, all of my friends, pretty much I have met now through this app and it, they are just, you know, some of the most amazing women, um, that, that it's just so interesting that the internet could bring us mm. together like this. And so for my listeners, you have, yeah. um, a lot of listeners probably are not on TikTok. Maybe their kids are, <laughs> but yeah. you have like over a million followers and you and your friends started something called the queen team. And can yes. you just talk a little bit about that? Because like, yeah. you're like um, amassing 
a huge fan base around that work. Yeah, it's crazy. So this queen team, okay, so when Kel- Kelsey and Cody and I are, Kelsey and Cody and me are, are the three of this. It was literally the first time we had all got together and met, um, like all three of us together. We were on a TikTok live and we randomly decided we're going to start this queen tribe and then tri- tribe ended up not working out and this is queen team. We had no idea really when we were saying it then what this was going to turn into, but it is like literally going around TikTok right now. And so what, what we want to do is basically be, you know, a group of women supporting, loving, and empowering other women. And so we just had our first business meeting. We like just got our business license. Like we're really, really doing this. Um, and there's actually, I believe six of us that are kind of in, um, the whole business side of it. And, uh, we actually got Heidi D'Amelio. Do you know Charlie D'Amelio? No. Okay. So Charlie D'Amelio is the most, she's like the most famous TikToker. She has 102 okay. million followers. So oh Heidi D'Amelio is her mom. Oh, so wow. she's, yeah. So she's very well known in the TikTok world. And so a couple of the girls actually went to her house and met her and she like made a queen team cake and she's like all for this and wants to be a part of it. So that is really, that was like a huge step for us because it's just nice having someone with um, like her experience and level on our team. So, but basically what we hope to do in the future, um, is do, um, like fundraisers and, um, a lot of volunteering. We're all going to kind of have like our own certain area where we're focusing in. Like one of them is going to be confidence. One of them is going to be positivity, um, fashion, domestic violence. Mine is going to be mainly, uh, recovery and addiction. And we're all going to kind of find our own ways to help in that. But then we're also going to do like queen retreats. So we're talking like possibly renting a whole resort and like people being able to come and we'll have different like speakers and events and, um, you're building an empire. Yes, we really are. And and, like just all these women already like are making these videos on TikTok and they just feel like so happy and loved and like a part of like all of a sudden just by like we say because we are inclusive we're not saying it's just six of us like we are literally anybody who wants to be a part of our team like you can be a part of our team like we have merch we got matching tattoos that's another (laughs) thing all of a sudden all these women were getting these crown tattoos that we got and it's just like what what did we even start but like it's it's amazing. So let me ask you then, because mm-hmm. your story is, you know, when you tell it, you have so much pain telling it, but mm-hmm. yet it's, it's part of who you are. Do you have yeah. any regrets? Would you go back and do anything different or is it, is it like where your growth came from and it allowed you to, to kind of step into your power now? Yeah, that's a good question. So I literally, like, I always say like my past doesn't define me. It made Mm me, I, you know, I went through a lot of stuff that I wouldn't wish anyone else in the, you know, have to go through, but all of that needed to happen. So I could be here where I am today. I would not be this person if I hadn't have gone through all that. And so that was hard for me when I started sharing my story to, like, are you, do you feel comfortable really telling the world, you know, that you lost custody of your kids as a parent? It's, you know, one of the worst things that could happen to you. And, um, you know, it's, it's, there's definitely pros and cons with it, but the pros outweigh, you know, the cons by far. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's amazing to be able to help other women in these situations and even other, you know, addicts and alcoholics. I actually, through TikTok, I got a job at a treatment center too. So, so many amazing things have come from TikTok, but no, I don't, so no, I don't regret anything. You know, I, I don't wish it on anyone to have to go through, but it made me who I am today. So what advice do you have for someone who's listening and maybe is secretly struggling or maybe not so secretly struggling um, with being an alcoholic or kind of in that place that, that you were? Yeah. So honestly, most of my messages I get are literally where I was at a year ago. And it breaks my heart because like I've been in that position. Um, like, like literally I'll be like, oh, I was just there. I was just there. And I know the feeling where it feels like you can't get through it. But like, if you set your mind to it, you just really have to want it. That's the thing is a lot of, like, I was ready. I was really ready to change my life and get sober and have, get my kids back and have my life back. But you have to be ready. Um, 
And you have, and I think just, just being honest, the first, the first step with anything is just accepting you have a problem. Um, and you know, the next step is really telling people about it. You don't have to tell the whole world like I did, you know, that's what I had to do me accountable, but you know, you don't definitely have to do that. But, um, yeah, definitely doing that. And another thing is, so I, so I chose at the beginning of my TikTok to share a lot about, um, my toxic relationship with my ex-husband. Um, and through this, it's, I mean, it's been like seven or eight months now. Um, you know, I'm at a point today where now we are able to co-parent. Finally, we are finally talking again. This is really new within the last week or two. Um, but I am not very proud about how, how I talked about him. You know, what I talked about happened and what I, what I shared was to raise awareness, mainly on like toxic behaviors, like gaslighting and emotional abuse and um, stuff like that. I really talked about it to raise awareness. So other women didn't get so far down the, down the hole as I did. Um, Cause gaslighting was a huge part of my story. And, but to be honest, like whether I want to admit it or not, like I chose to publicly shame the father of my children, mm-hmm. um, you know, on social media. And like, for that, I'm like embarrassed, honestly, mm-hmm. you know, I helped a lot of women. I get messages all the time. Like you gave me the courage to leave my narcissistic husband. And I, you know, I just, I hope that all those women, I hope they really needed to leave, you know? Yeah. And, um, it's just a hard place to be in because, my intentions were not to do that, but I see that now. So I hope now going forward where we're at with this co-parenting journey, you know, that that can be give hope now to those women who did leave and are probably going through the same thing what I went through with not being able to talk to them. I want to be able to show that, you know, you can find forgiveness. It took us a while. You know, we've, we've been going, we still aren't even officially divorced yet. And it's been a year and a half. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, and I think what you just said is important enough to highlight because it's that we are human and Mm -hmm. everyone makes mistakes along the way and that's okay. Like, I don't know anyone who has gone through the divorce process and has not said things, done things, you know, talked about their ex in a way that they will look back and say, Ooh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. I mean, it's such an emotional process. Right. It's a human reaction to do mm-hmm. that. Yeah. You know, so it, mm-hmm. th- I think the problem is when someone spends five years doing that, then it mm. just really hinders that co-parenting. But when you're in it For and sure. you, you still are in it, you're not even divorced yet, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that that that's important. So like, give yourself a break. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. I know. I was really a lot of like a lot of my friends were like, don't tell the internet, don't tell the internet like that. I'm kind of like back speaking with my kids as dad, but I was like, I just I share everything. Like social media is my life now. And I just I like really pride myself on being honest because in my addiction I was not honest at all. And so I just and I felt like what we were going through could actually be helpful to someone. Yeah. Um, there's even certain things like we had a conversation the other day, you know, I say gaslighting is the story of my life, yet I he doesn't even know what gaslighting is. Mm-hmm. So there's just a lot of things that I hope that in the future I like could possibly be helpful. Like what if these things were talked about more in relationships? Like maybe a lot more could have been avoided, right. you know? Maybe my intentions of what he was doing weren't the same as his, you know? I you know, I thought it was all for him to gain control, but maybe it wasn't. And mm-hmm. so I think there's just a lot to hold um that could possibly, you know, if this goes out well, like who knows, it's only been a couple weeks. So like everyone's like, yeah. Brittany, don't get your hopes up. You know, you've been hurt a few times. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that, I, I think that you just t- keep moving forward and you keep, you know, when all else fails, you treat it like a business relationship and yeah. you, you speak to each other like you would a boss and you remove the emotion from it. And, you know, sometimes that means not communicating on the phone immediately. Yeah. Like you're doing it through email or text or something like that, where you can have a second to pause and not react. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not- we've been using talking parents. Yeah, actually. Yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, and that, that, that's like one of those communication, uh, co-parenting apps, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There, there's a few of them out there. 
Um, so it's a journey. It's, it's yeah. a co-parenting, the go healing through the divorce is a journey. And then co-parenting mm-hmm. with that person is a journey too, because there's yes. so much emotion wrapped up in that. And then your story is even thicker because of what, you know, everything that you had gone through, um, to, to rise yeah. from it. But I think that the, the message of it is that you, anyone can absolutely come out the other side. And even mm-hmm. when you feel like you're at your lowest low and you're in your darkest place, like there is light if you allow it in. And if you're willing to mm-hmm. like pick yourself up and take a step forward, and that's what your story is about. And it's about being honest with yourself and um, yeah. really with, with, with the world. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Brittany, um, we know that there's huge things in store for you. Um, I'm excited to see how it all unfolds because y- your, your tribe is really blowing it up out there. I mean, you guys are doing some really awesome stuff. Um, yeah. So I'm excited to see where it goes. Um, yeah. where, where can everyone find you, follow you, connect with you? Yeah. So my name on TikTok and Instagram is Brittany Jade um, with underscores. For legal reasons, I decided to take my last name out, but then I still leave it in everywhere. And now it's like, whatever, (laughs) whatever. So Brittany Jade. um, And then our business name, we're calling ourselves the queen team, but our business name is technically perfectly queens. So you can find us on Instagram, perfectly queens or on TikTok, perfectly queens. We are just kind of starting getting those accounts going, but we're hoping to just kind of like from any woman who like want to be a part of it to kind of be able to join in. Um, So it's just a big a big community where, you know, these women know that they, that they are loved and they feel just a part of, um, Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us lose, I did, a lot of us lose ourselves in marriage and motherhood. I did not know who I was. And so this has been such an amazing opportunity for me to really figure out who I am. I'm, it's a definitely a journey. I'm still figuring out who I am, you know, especially with getting sober. Um, I'm coming up on 11 months now. It's crazy. It's going to be almost a year. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, it's been amazing. And another thing I really want to do is just show that, you know, sobriety can be fun. I think everybody thinks Mm. it's boring. And so I really want to be a positive influence in in that sake, because that was one of my biggest fears when I first got sober was, uh, I remember saying like, I'm going to be the most boring person ever. And you know, it's not the case. So, you know, you just brought something up and I can't let this interview end without talking about that because that is so important. Like there is such a trend that glamorizes drinking. And there Mm -hmm. was actually just an orange juice commercial that showed it was like the mother with her orange juice and pouring champagne and kind of like hiding from her kids. And that was like her, her break. And I mean, that's such, and they got a lot of slack for it. Um, Oh yeah. You know, it's, but that's kind of the culture that we're in is we, you know, we, we (laughs) drink to excess and it's, Mm -hmm. there's, you know, it's not, there's nothing bad with that. So I'm just wondering what your take is on that whole environment that we're, we're in right now. Yeah. It's almost like it's used as an excuse for like, I, like I'm thinking about in a, in a mom sense, like an excuse for like, like that's something the mom gets to do for like a, like a break. Like people used to yeah. always say to me, like when they would see my kids, cause my kids are amazing, but they're really crazy. Um, I have twin boys. So, <laughs> they're so cute though. <laughs> they, they, they would see my kids and they'd be like, Oh, the first thing people would say, honestly, is Brittany, no wonder why you drink so much you know? And right. I'd be like, Oh yeah, I know. Like, and I'd be like, no, and you know, it took me a while, but I'm like, no, I cannot use my kids for an excuse yeah. to drink. Um, and same on TikTok. It is huge. There's drinking challenges on TikTok. Yeah. And, um, thankfully I'm like not really on that side of TikTok because you can get on whatever side of TikTok you want to be on. It's crazy how the algorithm works. Do you do TikTok? I just signed up like a week ago. So Yay! Okay, <laughs> yeah. well, be prepared to be addicted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I only scrolled yeah. through a few times. I'm like, oh my God, there's everyone so creative on it. I'm like, I, I oh, can't yeah. do this right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, my whole take is just, I think it's, it's, it's very uh, looked down on as just like something that a mom gets yeah. to do. And even there's a lot of like, I've listened to interviews and videos when it's literally like people will ask, like, how do you get through the day? Or how do you, how do you co-parent? And like people's response is the first thing is drinking. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I know it's probably a joke, but I just, it's, it's, it 
it can be really serious for some people, obviously. Yeah. Some people will lose their whole entire family over it. Some people will lose their lives over it. And so that's been, you know, there's plenty of other other ways to go about, you know, you get finding your relief and dealing with, with stress um, that don't have to involve drinking. And props to everyone who can drink like a normal person, you know, like that's, so I, I say a normal person, that's what we call it if you're not an alcoholic. Yeah. So um, yeah, so props to everyone that can do that. That's amazing. But just, you know, some of us can't. And I mean, and I think that's such important work too, is to normalize that you don't have to be drinking um, in order to have some, a break or some stress relief, you know? I think it's been like a wake up call for even some of my friends. Most of my friends are sober, but the ones that aren't, they they don't drink around me. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I think it's been like kind of a nice like wake up call for them too, because the whole, a lot of the internet knows them for being very big, big partiers. And then mm. when I'm hanging out in the mix, it's like, they get the chance to say like, Hey, I, I like to drink. I choose to drink, but I don't need to drink, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's been an interesting, an interesting journey for sure. Well, thank you so much for sharing this because this is really a topic that I haven't spent a lot of time diving into and telling someone's story who sits on your side of it. Um, and yeah. it's such an important one because there are so many people out there who have that same story or, or are struggling with it themselves. So yeah. thank you. You are on your way to do some amazing, incredible things. So you are a queen in your own right. Thank you so much, Brittany. Thank you, Renee, for having me. Queen team. Yay. <laughs>